Okay, yeah. So welcome back to our lecture series. Uh, this week, we are going to be talking about backtracking. Um, so basically, uh, at our ICPC regional, there is a very high chance of some kind of Sudoku-like problem um, being one of the problems. Um, and the solution is basically just to brute force the answer um, with some optimizations. So you don't actually take like the exponential time that it would take to brute force it. Um, and in general, these kinds of problems are not like conceptually difficult, um, but figuring out how to implement them in such a way that um, you have enough optimizations that it's going to pass the time limit, um, but also it's not a ridiculous amount of code um, can be kind of hard. And so we're basically going to be going over one way to do that today. Yeah, so we're basically going to be going over a template I have for these types of problems. Um, this definitely isn't the only way to do things. So um, if you see things that are like you want to do a little bit differently, uh, if you see a problem like this, yeah, go ahead, because there's a lot of ways to do this. But yeah, OK. Oh, and one other thing before we get started is um, the time limit is very important for these problems, like constant factors uh, and things that don't usually matter in most other problems really matter for these. Um, so even if you're someone who sort of normally uses Java for everything, I'd really recommend C++ for this or C or something like that, um, because you're going to save like probably a factor of two compared to Java. Um, also, um, usually we say to use long longs instead of ints everywhere to avoid overflow. Um, but here you definitely want to use ints everywhere just to avoid that extra factor of two for dealing with 64 bit integers versus 32. Wait, isn't long long the same time on 64 bit machines? Um, it might be. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't really look into that. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt to use ints here. It's kind of the same reasoning uh, to use long longs uh, in other problems, like even when you don't need it, just because um, it might help you and it can't hurt you. It, kind of the same idea. So like, I don't know. I'm not sure what machine the ICPC is going to be on, uh, like what their judging servers are going to be on. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it might not make a difference, but it doesn't hurt you. Um, and finally, this header uh, is very nice. This will also save you like a good constant factor. I think I've gotten like a factor of two from this uh, on some backtracking problems. So this is also nice. OK. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, basically just solve Sudoku. So no variations, just normal Sudoku problem, because that's sort of a nice baseline to uh, start all of this from. OK, so the problem would look basically like this. Um, you're given some grid of numbers that represents an unsolved Sudoku grid, um, and you want to print out the solution, basically. Um, and ag again, what you need is every row, column, and three by three box has to contain the numbers one through nine. OK. So basically, the way we're going to do this is uh, traverse the grid from the top left to the bottom right. Um, so like go down each row from left to right in order. Um, at each square, you're going to, if, if it's empty, um, you're going to basically try to put every number into it. Uh, if that causes a contradiction, just skip that number. Um, otherwise, move on to the next square in the pattern. And if none of these nine numbers work, um, then you basically erase this number and go back to the previous square. So like here, we would try to put a 1 here. But we can't put a 1 here because there's a 1 in this box. Um, then we try to put a 2 here, and we iterate forward. Uh, we, we might like find some contradiction here that sort of forces us to iterate back. And then we would put a 3 here and keep going, sort of. So probably the best way to visualize what this process looks like is to look at some pseudocode for it. So it would basically look like this. Um, so when we go past the last square, um, so like sort of when we go outside um, the grid at the end, that means all of the other squares are good. So then we can return true. Um, if uh, So GR is what we're using for the current state of the grid. 
uh, which we're maintaining uh, through all these comparison. Um, if the current square is not zero, that means it's a fixed value. So we can basically skip over that square and go to the next one, where next star and next c is like the next square. Um, otherwise, if we have a zero there, we're basically going to through all the numbers from one to nine, check if we can put that number in position RC. Um, and then if we can, we're going to put X in RC. Uh, see if going to the next square, we can get a solution. Um, and if we can't get a solution by putting X in, if we can't get a solution in the next square, uh, then we sort of come back to this square, uh, take X out of RC and go on to the next value. And if we ever get, uh, out of this for loop, if we've tested all the values and we've never returned true, then we return false. Um, so anyone have questions on like the recursive structure here? We're going to go into detail on how to do like each of these operations soon. But does the general structure of this function make sense? All right, okay, I will take that as a yes. Um, okay, yeah, so the first thing we're gonna do is, uh, how do we check if we can put a given value in a position? And the way we're gonna do this is using bit masks. So for every row, column, and box, um, we're gonna store a bit mask of which values you can put in that row, column, or box. Like you can put in that set of squares essentially. Um, and so yeah, we're basically just gonna use the uh, last nine bits of the bit mask to store um, which values are allowed there. Uh, you can, so basically the I minus one bit is gonna indicate if we can use I there. Um, and it, so for Sudoku specifically, the code will be a little bit simpler if we just go uh, with the ith bit, but we'll get into why we're doing i minus one later. Um, so yeah, we have basically the last nine bits indicating which values are acceptable in that set, right? So initially, we can put sort of any value in any row, column, or square. This is before we've processed the inputs. Um, so initially, we want these all to be ones because we can put anything in all of those. Um, but then as we go on, we want to sort of update these. Um, and then let's say the board is in this state and we're looking at this square here. Um, the mask for its row would be this, because if you look, there's a three, five, and eight in the same row as it. So it's not allowed to be a three, five, or eight. Um, and similarly, the column has a one, two, and a four in it. So it can't be a one, two, or four. And the box has a two and a three in it. So it's not allowed to be a two or a three. Okay, so given uh, all of these bit masks, how do we determine um, which values we can put in a square in general? All right, so these give, this gives you which values we can put in a row uh, and a column and a box, but how do we determine which values we can put in a square? Given all of this information. Does anyone have questions on this? Yes. How, the, how we're storing the bit mask? Could you repeat the question? Right, yeah. So basically we have these for each of the rows and each of the columns and each of the boxes. But now we're looking at a specific square and we want to know for that square, which values can we use? So how do we get the bit mask of that given all of these? Don't you just do the, the and of all of them? Exactly, yeah. So um, if we want to know, like, for this square, which values can go in here, we take the bitwise and of these. Uh, any bit that is set in that will be set in all three of these, um, which means it's fine in the row, it's fine in the column, it's fine in the box. So that means we can put it in the square and not have to worry about it. Um, yeah. Uh, so any questions on this before we move on? Okay. 
Okay, so now um, to sort of update these masks, notice that if we want to either add or remove um, X from the mask, all we need to do is XOR it with one to the X minus one, right? So all that does is it sort of flips the X minus one bit, um, which the way we have it set up uh, toggles whether X is allowed in this mask. So um, to yeah, basically to put X in a square or remove X from a square, the code is gonna be identical. Uh, we just need to do this, where you XOR the row mask of the row, the column mask of the column with this value. And then we also need to sort of define this SQ value, which uh, given a row and a column tells you which square you're in. So basically what this does is it forms this array. Um, so SQRC will give you some index of what square you're in. And then you want to check the square mask of that square. And again, XOR it with one to the X minus one. Okay. So all, all we're doing with this is we're just toggling the X minus one bit to change um, whether X is allowed or not. All right. So uh, now that we have uh, this, we can sort of turn that pseudocode we had before into actual code. Um, so yeah, so I guess we can go over the add function first. Basically, um, add rcx1 is going to insert x into that position, and add rc that should be that should still be positive x. Add, c, add rcx negative one is going to remove x. Um, and the reason we're doing one versus negative one as opposed to just a Boolean, we'll get into that later, but um, yeah. So basically these three are what we just talked about in the last one where we're updating the masks. And this is maintaining the current state of the board, right? So if S is greater than zero, so if S is one, then we want to, we're adding X. So we wanna set grid RC equal to X. Otherwise, if S is not greater than zero, if we're in this case, then um, we want to set grid RC back to zero because we're clearing it basically. Um, but yeah, this is the only line that's different. These three are all what we just talked about. Wait, do we really care about what the actual grid value is? Well, at the end, you need to print it out. That's, oh, okay. Yeah, th that's basically all that's for. Um, yeah. Okay, and so yeah, then in the backtrack method, um, so we get past the end of the grid when r equals nine, right? Because r equals zero through eight are gonna be our actual rows. So r equals nine is past the end. So if we hit that, we return true because that means we're past the end. Then uh, ri and ci are basically the, if we go to the next square, um, what is the next square in our ordering? So ci, we're basically just incrementing the column mod nine, right? So if we're, not in the last column, we go to the next column. If we are in the last column, we go back to the first column. And R is going to be, um, or RI is gonna be the same as R unless we're in the last column, which is C equals eight, in which case we go to the next row. So C plus one over nine integer division is gonna uh, basically keep us the same row until we're at the last column, at which point it increments us to the next row. Okay. Uh, then here, uh, if grrc, this is, we're checking if there's already a value in the square. And if there is, that means that that's a given value. So we basically skip over this square. So, so we're basically skipping over this square. Um, and we can backtrack from the next square. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, oh, this is using some stuff we haven't introduced yet. But basically you're taking the bit the bitwise and of your three bit masks. Um, and that's gonna be your mask for this square. Um, and then you're gonna start with one, right? And keep going while, uh, so this is sort of, we could go up until X equals nine uh, and try to put all numbers from one through nine into this square. Um, but this is sort of an optimization where we need some bit to be set in at least the X minus one position, right? So like, let's say mask shifted to the X minus one is zero. 
that means if we keep increasing x, all of those values are going to be invalid. Um, so there's really no point in doing that. So if this is 0, we can just break. Uh, but you can sort of think of this as going up to x equals 9, um, to sort of make it easier to understand. Um, and yeah, so for each of these x values, this is checking if the x bit is set. This is the same as uh, mask and uh, 1 shifted to the x minus 1 is not 0. Um, this is just checking, is x OK in our bit mask, uh, given the rules we've set up for that. Um, and so if it's OK, then we add x to rc. If um, going from the next square works, then we can return true. Otherwise, we take x out of rc. And of course, if we get out of this loop, then none of the values will work in this square. So then we return false. OK. Uh, questions on this? There is kind of a lot going on here. OK. Um, so yeah, now for setting everything up. Um, oh, just one quick thing. This is a macro I'm going to be using a lot here. Uh, it makes a lot of this code, signi code significantly shorter. Um, so fik is just basically a for loop from 0 up to less than k. Um, yeah, it, it just makes writing things a lot shorter. So basically, to initialize everything, um, this is also using stuff we haven't talked about yet. That is my fault. Basically, we want to fill all the masks with 511. Um, and so you read in the input, and if the input value is not 0, we're going to add x to position rc. OK. And notice that we don't need some kind of special function to handle like the input here. We can just use the add function um, sort of in the same way as if we were adding it in the process of backtracking. OK. Um, and then the last piece of the code here is uh, output and the main method. So you can do output using a macro, where I basically just loop through everything, and print out the grid. Um, this is a nice trick that will uh, print out a space unless you're in the last column, in which case it prints out a new line. Um, but yeah, you can just sort of print out any way you want. This is sort of my preference. And then, so once you have all this, the main method is literally just call the initialize function, backtrack from 0, 0, and display. Wait, how does that space or new line thing work? Yeah, so this is uh, so this Boolean is going to be evaluated to either 0 or 1, um, which it will then take as an index into this string. So oh, Boolean, I see, I see. Yeah, it, it's nice. Um, so if this Boolean is false, it'll look at the 0th character, which is this. And if it's 1, it'll look at the new line character. Remember that. Um, yeah. And so sort of the main reason uh, I like to use uh, the output as a macro as opposed to just putting it in the main method here is that um, it's very nice for debugging. Um, like if you want to print out the first k iterations of backtracking or whatever, um, you can do something like this, where like you have some global count. And uh, while the count is less than 10, you display it, print out a new line. And so this will give you like the first 10 steps that your code does, um, which is uh, usually very helpful when you're trying to find a problem because usually when there's a problem it'll show up in like the first few iterations um so yeah this is a nice way to do it um yeah so anyone have any questions on the code so far okay all right, so now uh, that, that was basically how we can solve Sudoku. Um, so now we want to sort of take what we had there and generalize it to something we can use in more problems without having to modify it too much. Um, so first of all, here's just a bunch of variables. So uh, in the Sudoku code, we were using these as constants. Um, but in general, we want these to be able to take on more general values. Um, so first, uh, n and m are dimensions of the grids. That's 9 to 9. 
uh, DFV is the default value, which means like empty square or whatever. So we were using zero for that. Um, then min value, max value are the min and max valid values that you can put in a square. So one and nine. Um, and M is the number of masks for each square, which in Sudoku was three because you have the row mask, the column mask, and the square bit mask, which again, we were taking the end of all three of those to determine if it was valid. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, generalize how we're dealing with these bit masks. So before we were talking about them as basically three separate arrays. Um, and we want to uh, simplify that all down to one array because it gets much harder to maintain the code if uh, you have, say, like a lot of different masks per square. Um, you don't want to have to go through every time you mention a mask in the code and sort of add a new line for that type of mask. It's much nicer. symmetrically, because they are all kind of doing the same thing. 2D array, um, where mask 0R is going to be the row masks, mask 1C is going to be the column masks, and mask 2 square RC is the square mask of square RC. So basically just taking these three, turning them into three rows of a two-dimensional array. And the one additional piece we need to make this work is uh, MT, which sort of gives you like the mask type uh, for some i, um, where basically the goal behind this macro is we want to be able to do this. Um, we want to be able to have mask zero, m r t zero be the row mask, and one m t r c one be a column mask. Basically, you want mask i, m t r c i to be um, one of the masks for your square. Right. So now what we can do once we have this structure here. Um, is we can just iterate i from zero to three and put i in here, i in here, and that gives you your three masks. So for updating the masks, that makes it much nicer to do. Um, and you'll notice that the way mt is set up, it's basically set up so that mt rc zero is r, mt rc one is c, mt rc two is square rc. So basically just getting these two um, to be like giving us equal things essentially. You, basically what I'm saying is like you can think of MT as like pulling out the ith component of RC, where like the first component is R, second component is C, third component is square RC. All right, does this make sense? Because this is probably one of the most abstract parts of this. Okay. And so now um, the add method gets much shorter because now instead of having to update all of our masks, um, we just go from I from one to M. Again, big M is the number of masks per square, which in uh, Sudoku's case is three. And we do mask I MT RCI, which again gives us like the ith mask for that square. And we XR that with one shift to the X minus one. And here, notice that we're uh, keeping it sort of the same structure. We're not like actually looping here. Um, that's just because if adding in a for loop there is in general probably going to make it longer um, because you'd have to sort of initialize the mask to like something with all the bits set and then loop over it and end it with all of those. It would, it would be messier. So here we're sort of keeping the same structure. But in add, uh, this makes it much nicer. And uh, everything else here is going to be the same as we had. The one difference is um, we've added in all those variables we were talking about, right? So we don't have nine here because it might not be nine columns. We don't have M. So this is number of columns. This is number of rows. Um, we're checking if it does not equal the default value here. Uh, that's, yeah, that's the only other change is we've sort of added in these new variables to generalize it. Oh, in these types of problems, is it always going to be a grid, never like, a, I don't know, cubic or whatever? Yeah, so uh, 
the only ones that have happened so far have been a grid. Um, I guess it's possible that it could be a cube, but it hasn't happened yet. So, yeah. And oh yeah, the other thing is, uh, it's also always been a rectangle. So we can't always assume that like, I mean, we are can always assume that like number of rows and number of columns is consistent. Okay. And the other thing we want to add in is uh, the ability to do some small like local checks, um, which are basically constraints that like don't have anything to do with a bit mask. Uh, so we're going to do an example problem to sort of show what kind of thing this could be. Um, but basically the idea is that like it, it does checks that you can't do with a bit mask. Um, so you make some Boolean function that tells you uh, if position RC uh, is valid or if it causes a contradiction. Um, and we're going to put that uh, right before we sort of go to the next square in backtrack in these two positions. So sort of before you go to the next square, you have to make sure that putting that value in didn't mess you up um, for whatever constraints you have in the problem that uh, are not like something you can do with a bit mask. Okay. So yeah, so one example problem for this would be, uh, this was uh, on the SPC uh, a few years ago. Um, you're given an n by m grid where n and m are less than or equal to seven, uh, and the squares are partitioned into some uh, pieces like this. And if a piece is of size k, you have to have the numbers from one to k, um, and you can't have equal numbers touching even diagonally. Um, so notice that we don't have sort of the row or column constraints that Sudoku would have, because you have a bunch of ones in this row, uh, two ones in this column. Um, but within every piece, so like this piece here with five squares, has the numbers one through five. Um, and there's also no two touching numbers uh, that are equal. All right. So first, we're going to talk about how to do bit masks for this problem. And bit masks here are going to be significantly easier than uh, for Sudoku because we only have one type. So m equals one. And you, you can basically get rid of sort of this m and mt structure if you want. Um, but sort of if you have the original template already, it's much easier to just sort of work within that, let m equal one. And then um, if we let the piece of each square be prc, you can think of this uh, like sqrc. It's like giving you the square you're in. It's giving you the piece you're in. Um, so if we define mtrci to just give you prc, um, then the only change we have to make to the code is the code and backtrack where we do this loop over all the types of masks is now just mask zero prc. Um, so these, this would be the only changes to the code um, for the bit masks. Um, does this make sense in general? It's a simpler structure. So you're only basically worrying about one bit mask. Kind of just going back to um, treating the one bit mask separately. All right. Yeah. So this is essentially the same as what we had, just making some small changes. Um, then uh, what's going to be uh, more changes is uh, checking, uh, like, if a square is like valid, like, locally. So essentially, what we need to do is. Um, check that if we've just put some value in a square, check that this doesn't break it. Um, and the only way this could break it is, because we're already doing the mask checks, um, the only way this could break it is we can't have the neighbors equal each other, right? Um, so we're going to use this macro, which is generally helpful, which tells you if a square is inside the grid or not. Um, so then to check if a square is OK, we're basically just going to loop over all of its neighbors. Um, and if the grid values there are equal, we return false. Otherwise, we return true. Um, notice that we have to check that at least one of dr and dc is non-zero. Because otherwise, um, if dr and dc are both zero, that's going to check the same square 
Um, and obviously that's going to be equal to itself, so then it'll always return false. Um, but basically what this does is, this is checking your eight neighbors, right? Because this is going to, the for loop is going to iterate nine times, but you're going to skip the one where you check yourself. So it's just checking your eight neighbors, basically. And it, in general, this uh, function is something you kind of have to rewrite for every problem because every problem is going to have some different condition. Um, but yeah, for this, this is all you have to check. All right. Make sense? Wait, how do we update the bitmask for each square again? Right. So um, updating the bitmask is going to be we are still going to do it uh, using this. Um, and notice that we don't have to change this for the new problem um, as long as we change m and mt the right way. Um, this will, if we keep the add function exactly the same, um, add rcx will still work properly even with um, this new mask setup. So sort of the only things you have to change are like, what what are your bit masks for each square, right? So in Sudoku, the bit masks were row, column, and square, but here the bit mask is just piece. Um, so as long as you do this update and uh, this update, you just basically use the same code we had in the template. Yeah. So add is going to stay exactly the same as it was here. that make sense? OK. All right. Yeah, and then uh, the other big thing with this problem would be initializing the values. Um, but the way this problem gives you input is absolutely horrible. Um, like, I think the input format involves like parentheses and stuff. Um, so we're not going to get into exactly how to do that. Um, it's, it would be very tedious, uh, but generally doable. Um, you just kind of have to write it out for this one. Um, but yeah, in, in general, updating init and uh, locally valid are going to take up most of the time solving these problems. Because the rest of it, like we were just talking about with add, um, the rest of it generally doesn't have to change too much. Um, as long as you set up uh, the mask and mask types properly. All right, so questions on anything for this problem or on the way we generalize the template? OK. All right, so now we're going to uh, talk about how to handle another type of constraint you might encounter, which is like a sum constraint. So basically, we want to be able to handle a third type of constraint besides like the bit mask constraints where you don't have duplicates um, and sort of small local checks like we were doing before. Um, so we want to be able, basically be able to do constraints in the form. Uh, every row has to add up to this or every column has to add up to this or whatever. Um, and basically there's two reasons for this. So one is uh, this is going to be the way we do this um, is going to be slightly faster than if we included this in the local checks, right? Because there's no reason we couldn't do these uh, in the local checks, right? Uh, so you could check when you put a value in a square, uh, is that the last empty value in this row? And if so, uh, do we have the correct sum? And you could do that. Uh, but sort of the two problems with that are, one, uh, it's going to be slower, and two, um, it's going to be more code, which means potential for more errors. So if we sort of make a general structure for this, like we did with the bit masks, um, that's going to make this uh, significantly nicer to deal with. OK. So sort of a motivating problem for this is, uh, we'll say you have 8 by 8 grid. You want to fill it with values 1 through 5, um, where each row has to add up to some value uh, and each column has to add up to some value. And the values are different for each row and column. Um, and sort of input output, same as Sudoku, you get uh, like 
zeros for the empty squares and one through five for the other ones. Okay. So the idea of our solution is given some board state and a square, um, this square can take on values in some range A to B, right? So there's some minimum value we can put in the square and some maximum value we can put in the square and everything else in the middle is gonna be okay. Um, and you, you can think about it as like, you can sort of, if you're at the max value, you can sort of take, yeah, I don't know what way to justify it is. Um, we'll get into that as we go a little bit further on. Um, so what we're gonna do is store the remaining sum we need in each row or column. Um, so like in this first row, the sum is 23, but the remaining sum we need minus the three and the two is gonna be 18. So for this row, we would store 18 initially. So yeah, we're storing the remaining sum needed in each row or column as well as the number of empty spaces left. So given those two pieces of information for say a row, um, how do we determine the min and max values that can go in that row? So we know sort of how much, what sum we need in the remaining squares, and we know how many squares are remaining. Um, so given that you can only use the values one through five, uh, how can we determine the min and max values for that row, th that we can put in that row? And the idea is kind of to do something greedy, I guess you could say. So I guess a more concrete example would be like, uh, so we said the sum here was 18. So we need a sum of 18 in six spots. Um, what are the min and max values we need to use or we could use? That's probably a bad example because we can use any value from one through five on that. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's sort of the general problem. I think I'll just show you guys. Um, so sort of the idea is, uh, let, let's say the row has K empty squares. If you want to find the minimum element you can put there, See what happens if you put a value of five in the other k minus one empty squares, right? Because if we know that the sum of those k squares is fixed, if we want to minimize the value in one square, you put the max value in all the other squares, right? And see what's left over here. Um, and then the min value, you do the opposite. Um, oh, to find the max value, sorry. If you want to find the max value, you can put in a square. Uh, see what happens if you put the min in every other square. Um, so in this example, we need uh, these three squares to add up to a sum of 11. Um, so if we want to find the min value, we put five in the other two and we're left with one. If we want to find the max value, we put one in the other two and we're left with nine. Um, so therefore the range things can be in is one to nine. Um, but notice that uh, our range also has to fit in like the range of valid values. So we have to intersect it with min value, max value, which is one to five. Um, so taking the intersection of one nine and one five, we could see that you can use any value from one to five in this row. Does this make sense? So given some sum and how many empty squares you have, you're basically just greedily assigning all of the other squares, either the min or the max, to find out what the range on your current square is. Questions on this? Okay. 
Um, and one quick note on this. Um, notice that if there's only one empty square left, um, the min and max values that we will generate with this formula are both going to be the required sum. Right? So if empty is 1, these two values are going to be equal, and they're both going to equal sum, which means if you have one square left and you know the sum of all the squares that are currently empty, you know what that has to be. Um, this is going to force you to have that sum in that square. So as, after we proceed past a row or a column, um, we know that they're going to have the correct sum. So we don't need to do any other checks to make sure it works. All we need to do is add each square, generate this min and this max, and iterate all the numbers between them. All right, so questions on this process? Okay. Um, and so the code for this, um, in this version where we have the row sums and column sums, um, this is basically what we were just talking about. So to get the min value for R and C, uh, you take the max of the min value overall that we can use, so in this case, one. Um, then this is the value we get when we try to minimize the value in the row, and this is the value we get when we try to minimize the value in the column. So we want to take basically the max of those minimums, because we're doing basically interval intersection across these three intervals. Um, and for max, we're doing the, the same thing, except we're basically finding the leftmost max endpoint, so the min of all the max endpoints of those intervals. Um, yeah, so min of max v, which is 5, value we get in the row, value we get in the column. And again, yeah, I don't know if I said that. R sum is the remaining sum left in the row. C sum is remaining sum left in the column. R empt is number of empty squares in the row. C empt is number of empty squares in the column. We're, we're just doing the same formula we had in the last slide here. Okay. And uh, so we're also going to have uh, the add and backtrack functions in a similar way to when we were doing bitmask constraints, um, but slightly different. So for add, um, we were doing the same thing here uh, with s. And this is why we're using s equals 1 or negative 1 as opposed to a Boolean, um, because that lets us do stuff like this. So let's say s is 1. Um, that means we are putting x into that position which means we want to remove that from the remaining sum because we're sort of fixing x there. So then we want to subtract x, um, which is s times x because s is 1. Uh, but let's say we were uh, adding or we were removing x from that square. Then we want to be um, adding x back to the sum because now x is free. Because now that square is free again, so that x is back to sort of the free part of the sum. So then we would subtract negative x because s is negative. X. And same idea with the empties. Um, if we're adding x, we're decreasing the number of empty squares. If we are um, removing x, we're increasing the number of empty squares. So this will change by either plus or minus 1. And over here, um, the only change is um, this, yeah, this is also something we haven't talked about yet. Uh, but this should be get min rc, and this should be get max rc. Um, so we get, we're using these two functions um, to get the min and the max values that x can be. And then we iterate over those values, um, put x in that position if it's locally valid. In this case, LV will always be true because we don't have any sort of local checks to do. Um, and yeah, so if it works, then we return true. Otherwise, remove x. If no x works, return false. So the structure backtrack is extremely similar to uh, what we had before, and add is also pretty similar. But we're just dealing with these different way of getting which values we can put there. Right. Questions? 
Wait, Joe, in the um, get x function, are the booleans just for like to tell if you're getting the min or getting the max? Uh, yes, so it is. That is, um, yeah, that, that's the typo. I, that should say, uh, it should have the get min and get max there with no booleans. Um, but yes, okay. we are in, in, in a couple slides, we're going to talk about how to sort of pass in a boolean and combine them to one function. Yeah, okay. that's basically what that does. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to generalize this code the same way we generalize the bit mask code. Um, so the same way we turned the masks into a two-dimensional array, we're gonna do the same thing for empty and sums. Um, and in order to use that, we need um, S and ST, which are basically the same as M and MT. Um, so S is basically giving you sort of the number of components you have in each square. Um, so in this case, the only components we have are row and sum, because those are the only uh, things where we have the sum constrained. So STRCI is pulling out the ith component, which uh, is either R or C, depending on if I is zero or one. Um, and this again gives us the nice structure we had before with the bit masks, um, where we can basically iterate for i from zero up to s and do sm i st rci um, and that'll give us sort of the ith component of the sums and the empties okay so it, it's basically the same structure we had for masks except we're doing it for empties and sums okay questions All right. So what this does to get min and get max. Um, so now uh, we start out with our min value as uh, the actual min value we can put in, so one. And then for each of our components, um, we're basically maxing the current min value with um, the value we get from that sum and that empty value, right? So Basically, first we're looking at the row sum and the row empty value. Then next we look at the column sum and the column empty value, because um, this is going i up to two. So we're going to do two cases here, and return the min. And then max is basically the same thing. We've just changed this max to a min, and this max to a min as well. Okay. Uh, but notice here that these two functions are incredibly similar. So there's a lot of like redundancy in this code that we can remove. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by introducing this Boolean as the third parameter. Um, yeah, so basically get x rc true is going to return the min, get x rc false is going to return the max, like we were talking about a couple slides ago. Um, so yeah, all, all we're doing here is we're taking these two functions, um, and anytime we have a difference here, we're turning that into a ternary. So the initial value is either min or max. Then we get the sum value and the empty value minus one. And depending on if we want the min or the max, we do one of these two statements. And then we turn ends. And this is going to be um, about half the code of the other two, because there's we're, we're sort of not adding much code from just one of these functions by itself. Um, so yeah. Questions on how we update this? Okay. And then um, add is going to be uh, sort of a similar change to how we had the bit masks after we did the generalizing thing. So here, um, for each of our sort of components that has a sum type, um, we're doing the subtracting s times x from the sum and subtracting s from empty. And this is again gonna either add or subtract x to your sum and add or subtract one to your number of empties, depending on if s is one or not. Okay. All right, uh, so anyone have any questions on this problem or how to do some constraints in general? All right, 
Uh, so now the last part, uh, this should be pretty quick. Uh, so this is combining the templates. So uh, there has not yet been a problem at ICPC um, that had the sum constraints and the bitmask constraints. Um, but I think it is very possible that something like that would happen eventually. Um, so sort of having these two templates combined into one is a very nice thing to have. Also, this way, you only have to really worry about one template. Um, so yeah, we're, we're basically just going to go over how to combine bitmask stuff with the sum stuff. And in general, most of the time, that's going to just be take the code from both of them and combine it. Um, so yeah. So first of all, macros and global variables. Uh, this looks like a lot, um, but this is all stuff we've talked about so far. So you have the for loop macro, um, the printout macro, uh, this check, which is very helpful to have for uh, checking like local checks, especially, because a lot of them will have, you'll have to check like all the neighbors of a square or something. Um, then we have the square macro, which is also showing up in a lot of problems because a lot of problems have the same sort of three by three squares structure Sudoku does. They just do different things with it. Um, and then uh, M, T, S, T, M, and S. These are for sort of the generalized masks and some stuff we talked about. Um, N is, yeah, N is the one thing we haven't talked about. So basically N is gonna be, um, in, in general, it's probably good to just keep it at some ridiculously high value that it, you'd never have to go past. Like if you do N squared, like uh, by N, I mean dimension of the grid. If you do like N squared or NM, that's generally good. But what N represents is, notice we're using it for all these arrays. So for example, um, it, it basically has to be bigger than, um, any number of sets that you're splitting your grid up into. So let's say we had that other problem from before where you partition your grid up into sets and each set has to contain the values one through K. So N would have to be at least 49 because you could potentially put every square in its own set. And then mask zero has to be of size 49. But in general, if you don't wanna to have to worry about what to make N, just make it like 100 or like 500, it doesn't matter. Um, it would increase Wait, your memory, it, but I, th I thought we were storing the masks as like longs or whatever. No, masks are ints um, because we're assuming that in all of these problems, if you if uh, you can put more than like thirty distinct values into a square, um, then the complexity of this is going to go way up, and it's probably not going to be possible. Um, so then doesn't n have to be less than a uh, 32? No, because n is um, n is the number of sets, not the number of things in each set. So I'm saying we're making every set size one. Um, so then the bit mask only needs to be zero or one. Um, but there's going to be like 49 separate bit masks. So we need our bit mask array to go up to size 49 or whatever. Um, but in general, yeah, I thought we have it, one for each set. So like when it was 49, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't actually use less than that. Um, right, yeah. So there might be a case, uh, let's go back to that problem real quick. There might be a case they give you here where N and M are both seven and every square is its own thing. So the solution would just, oh wait, that's not gonna be possible because you can't have, a, whatever. A assume you can have neighbors be the same value. And let's say you put every um, square in its own box. So now you're gonna have 49 of these different sets, 49 pieces. Each piece needs its own bit mask. So our bit mask array has to be of size at least 49. Oh, so wait, for this one, you would have to use long longs because the uh, bit mask might be up to 49 in size, right? Um, I think I think they put an upper bound on the size of a piece. I think they said a piece can't be bigger than like, I don't know, seven or something. Um, so you, you don't need that. Um, 
but the number of pieces could be n squared, essentially. So each individual piece is capped at its size at like seven or something, but in the number of pieces um, could go up to the number of squares, essentially. Yeah, so that's why in general, it's a good idea to just have this be some huge value that's like bigger than the number of squares in the grid, because it'll hurt your memory, uh, but that doesn't really matter because you're not gonna have much memory here anyway. Um, yeah, and then these are all values we talked about before. And you have your grid, your mask array, your empty array, and your sum array. All right. Okay. Um, so then we have these three functions that we talked about before. So, like I said before, this uh, the local checks are very problem dependent. So uh, you sort of have to implement this uh, its own way for every problem. So we just have return true in the template. Um, add RC excess. You'll notice we took, we basically just took the way to do it for sums and the way to do it for masks, which are the first and the last line. Uh, and we just sort of combine them. Um, and then get X is taken directly from the code for sums. So these three are all pretty much what we just had. Um, the backtrack function, um, we're, we're also sort of smashing it, uh, the two versions together. Um, so we get the mask in general. Um, notice that we might have to update this. We will probably have to update this if this is not the exact structure of our masks. Um, but then we also get the min x and the max x, the way we do the sums. And um, instead of starting at min v, we're going to start at min x. Um, and our, anytime we hit either one of our stopping conditions, so anytime we go past max x, or we get to the point where there are no set bits left in the bit mask, um, then we're going to stop. Then we check that it's in the bit mask, and this part is all the same as both. All right. Questions on this part? Uh, and then in it, um, we fill all of our bit masks uh, with uh, one shifted to max minus min plus one. Uh, this is actually the way we um, were doing i minus one in Sudoku. Um, because if you have, let's say uh, you're, you're allowed to put negative values into a square, uh, you can't shift a negative amount. Um, so instead of shifting by the value itself, you shift by the value minus the min value. And this sort of forces your values to be indexed by zero through max minus min. Um, and so because of this, our bit mask is gonna be uh, one shifted to max minus min plus one minus one, which will be basically max minus min plus one ones. Um, yeah, so then uh, you're gonna fill the uh, empty arrays with however many squares are empty there, uh, and the sum squares, uh, the sum arrays with, with whatever the sums have to be. We just have placeholder value here. Um, yeah, and then you read in the input. If you have to add it into a square, you just do the add function. And then main is the same. Uh, a, a couple things I put on here, just things to be aware of. Uh, uh, if there is no solution, BT, oh, oops. If there is no solution, uh, BT will return false. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, and also you might need to reset the board if there are multiple test cases, um, which we're not doing here, right? Because we're not directly modifying grid. Um, yeah, and the other thing here is we need to check, uh, do you need to check if, um, there is a solution at all in the beginning, right? Because let's say they give you a grid um, that has like two ones next to each other in Sudoku. Um, do you need to detect that? So basically these two are only if you're not guaranteed to have a solution, um, but 
in general, I think all of the problems that have showed up by CPC have been guaranteed to have a solution. So it's not a huge thing to worry about, but yeah. All right, uh, questions on this? All right, yeah, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, link to these slides is on Discord as always. Um, and I will put a link to my template up here right after this. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for coming.